So, all right. Okay, so skin cancer is a topic of today. Um, and then we'll be going over what does it look like, the types of skin cancer, screening, preventing it, and um, some treatments and further research going on for skin cancer. So first, what does skin cancer look like? So there's some pictures on the right and there are certain types of skin cancers. So these aren't all the same thing, but in general, they have all kinds of things such as a smooth pink or pale bump, like that top right picture, um, a dry, flat, crusty patch of skin. Uh, some of these might seem a little similar to what you might've seen in the past, but usually they look a little more severe than normal, uh, but not always. So a pink raised bump, um, wart-like growths. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard the, the dangerous wart that no one suspects. Uh, a red spot or irritated area, um, bleeding sores that usually just never heal or uh, scars that kind of change or uh, just come out of nowhere. Um, uh, sometimes in the fingernails, you'll see like a black or brown streak. Um, um, and then the mole that has different shades of color, probably heard of that as well, or a newer changing mole. So now we'll go into the types of skin cancer, uh, the most common uh, three types. So the first one, the most common is called basal cell carcinoma. And it arises in the epidermis, which is this top layer of the skin, if you can see on the left. Um, and that is, like I said, the most common form of uh, cancer worldwide. So it counts about accounts for about 80% of skin cancers in the US and 40% um, of people who have basal cell carcinoma will develop another skin cancer within five years. So it's kind of has a, a relatively high reoccurrence rate. Um, and then when it comes to risk, risk factors, when it comes to uh, basal cell carcinoma, you can see, you've probably heard it comes, uh, it's regarding UV exposure from either the sun or indoor tanning beds. And if you look on the right, you probably heard there are two types of UV light, which is UVA and UVB. Um, and this graphic kind of helps you see that UVA penetrates the skin a little bit deeper. And that's kind of what's related to aging and wrinkles because it, it just hits the skin a little bit deeper while UVB is related to more like burns and uh, skin, the skin cancer itself. So the nice thing is that UVB is blocked by windows. So it's a nice little tidbit. Uh, I mean, uh, blocked by glass. So nice little tidbit to uh, feel safer indoors. Uh, other risk factors is age, um, fair, fair skin, freckling, light hair. These are things that are associated with it. Not necessarily that having light hair causes skin cancer. Uh, personal history of skin cancer, of course, and then exposure to radiation. Um, you know, sun is a form of radiation, but also um, uh, other things like other cancer treatments and whatnot. Uh, and just in general, an impaired immune system, a history of transplant, chemotherapy, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, things that just mess with the immune system and your body's natural ability to destroy these cancer cells. So the second uh, type of skin cancer is squamous, squamous cell carcinoma. So also it arises from the epidermis, that top layer of the skin. It is the second most common form of skin cancer. And it can kind of start with this precancerous spot. It's called actinic keratosis or also solar keratosis. It's kind of like a, a scaly uh, dry lesion in the skin, if I remember correctly. And the, um, there are aggressive types of squamous cell car carcinoma uh, in the lips, in the ears, and sometimes it can spread to the lymph nodes. And it can also even spread to the lungs, uh, which I think is why this, this graphic of the lungs and whatnot is on the left here. Uh, and there are increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma with um, the HPV infection and also just smoking. So another reason to quit smoking. And, um, uh, solid organ transplants can um, definitely increase your risk of squamous cell carcinoma as well. So the third type is uh, melanoma. Um, it is the most dangerous type. And it, it arises from the, um, the pigment producing cells in the epidermis. Uh, they're called melanocytes. It's what makes skin dark, basically. So it mostly um, affects the skin and sometimes the eyes. And like I said, it's the most deadly form of skin cancer. Uh, rising for quite a bit of uh, a high, high percentage of the skin cancer deaths. 
but um, thankfully it's not that common. Uh, as if you remember the basal cell and squamous cell are more common. And, um, but if you catch it early, it has a 95% curable rate with uh, surgical excision. So it's a good thing to look out for. And um, sunburn as a child does seem to increase your risk of melanoma. And um, just some risk factors to go over. Um, as usual, the UV exposure from the sun or tanning beds, the fair skin, freckling, light hair, age. Uh, and then, uh, like I was saying before, the moles, um, they can be just not like a regular mole, and then it, it would be called an atypical or dysplastic mole. And then that can uh, turn into melanoma or just having a lot of moles, um, uh, large moles that were there from birth. That's what congenital means. And, or just a personal or family history of melanoma, of course. All right, and then Kimberly will go on to screening for skin cancer. Thank you, Haran. So um, I'll be talking about skin cancer screening next. And Haran, if you could please proceed the slide. Sorry, okay, here we go. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so screening for skin cancer is very important because it allows individuals to potentially catch skin cancers at an early stage when they're more easily treated. Screening for skin cancer is recommended if you have a family history of melanoma in two or more closely related relatives. If you also notice that you have a lot of unusual moles or scaly patches of skin, um, especially in regions of the body that are often exposed to the sun, it's highly recommended that you make an appointment and just get them checked out. Um, next, please, Haran. Skin cancer screening usually involves a total body skin exam. And during this procedure, the patient will completely undress and be given a gown to wear. Your dermatologist or healthcare provider will use a special tool known as a dermatoscope and closely examine your skin from your scalp all the way down to your toes. And if they see any suspicious moles or patches of skin, they'll usually take a skin biopsy or a sample of skin and check to see if it is cancer. And they'll closely monitor these areas with follow-up appointments. And usually these total body skin exams are quite brief. They only last about five to 10 minutes. Next, please. We also want to share some tips for how to make your appointment go smoothly. So firstly, if you have any questions or concerns that you might want to ask your dermatologist, please try to write these questions down ahead of time so that during your appointment, you'll have them ready and available. Also, since patients will have to completely undress for the total body skin exam, you might want to consider wearing an outfit that you could take off easily and put on easily. This will help speed up the skin exam process and also give you and your doctor more time to go over your questions or concerns. Also, please try to avoid wearing makeup on the day of your exam. This is because makeup can make it a little difficult to clearly examine your skin and you don't want that to happen. And additionally, if you're taking some medications or use some skin products, please bring a list or take some pictures so that your doctor knows what you're using. Next, please. I'll also go over some guidelines on how to prevent skin cancer. Next, please. Thank you. One of the most important practices for skin cancer prevention is to wear sunscreen. The American Academy of Dermatology recommends choosing a sunscreen that has an SPF rating of 30 or higher one that is broad spectrum, meaning it blocks both UVA and UVB rays, and also one that's water resistant for up to 40 or 80 minutes. We recommend applying the sunscreen 30 minutes before going outside and reapplying every two hours. It's also recommended that you wear your sunscreen every day, even on cloudy days, because UV rays can still penetrate and reach your skin. Please also keep in mind that the amount of sunscreen you need to completely cover all sun exposed areas of your body is about one ounce. So that's enough to fill a shot glass. Next, please. Another important practice is to simply avoid sun exposure when you can and cover up your skin. For example, you could wear sunglasses or sun hats to protect your eyes and face. You could also wear long sleeve clothing to protect your body. And you might also want to wear sunscreen under your clothes too. Keep in mind that lighter clothing provides less UV protection, less SPF. So you might want to also consider buying UV protective clothing. And we've indicated some of these UV protective clothing brands here, and they can be safely treated using laundry treatments such as SunGuard, as we show here to the right. Next slide, please. 
Also, on extra sunny days, you might look for areas of shade, especially between the hours of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., because that's when the sun is brightest and hottest. You might also want to use an umbrella if you're walking outside, um, that'll help protect your body. And on really sunny days, you could also consider just staying indoors just to avoid the super intense sun. Next, please. Additionally, we recommend staying away from sun tanning and tanning beds. This is because tanning beds can also expose your body to the same types of harmful sun rays, but this time at a much closer distance to your body. And research has shown that tanning speeds up skin aging and also increases your chances of getting skin cancer. So we recommend saying no to sun tanning and tanning beds. Thank you. And Anna is gonna carry on next about the treatments for skin cancer. Well, <clears throat> all right. So a, a few other additional points um, about, um, about skin cancer prevention as well. It talks about um, so who's got your back? It says that 43% of people rarely or never ask someone else to apply sunscreen to their back. So it's really important to, you know, make sure that you're getting sunscreen everywhere um, where the sun is going to hit. Um, also, also it talks about um, the fact that 16% of melanomas are found by spouses or significant others. Um, and so, you know, having someone, a loved one um, examine your skin can be very helpful. Um, and then also you should ask um, a significant, significant other or your, you know, your doctor about um, checking hard to see areas. In addition, um, in addition, um, hair stylists can also be another, anybody who's looking at your skin regularly. So if you have a, you know, somebody that you see for massages, um, that can be, um, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting calls. Um, I'm on call this evening and I'm getting some, some calls. I might ask actually ask um, Kimberly if she wouldn't mind um, continuing on with this slide. Sure, I Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so yeah, as Anna was saying, um, if you know someone who takes a look at your skin regularly, they can help figure out and check to see if there's something unusual that's happening, if they see uh, maybe a mole that, has, that wasn't there before but now is, and they let you know, then that might recommend you to find a, get an appointment to get some screening and just check it out to see if it's cancer or something. And even if it's not, at least you'll um, be at peace of mind, <laughs> so you know. And yeah, next please, Haran. So um, in order to help with skin, ca uh, skin cancer prevention and screening, you might want to self-exam your skin every month. So. For example, when you're in the shower, you could just take a look um, at your arms, your body, just to see if there's anything unusual that wasn't there before. Also at this website, aad.org, they have some useful tools. So you could download a body mole map there and see, look at the information. You can also look for the ABCDs. So on the right here, we have this poster. Um, A stands for asymmetry. So you wanna see, does one half of the mole look like the other half? Is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? If it's asymmetrical, that might be a sign of melanoma. Um, B stands for border. So look at the border. Is it irregular or is it smooth? If it's irregular and it has some scallop shape or a poorly defined border, that's another sign of potential melanoma. You could also take a look at the color for C. Um, See if the color is a uniform color or does it vary from one area to another. For example, if it has shades between tan and brown or black or white, red, and even blue, that might be a sign of melanoma. You should also consider the diameter of the moles. So melanomas are usually bigger than six millimeters, which is about the size of a pencil eraser. Um, but however, um, they could be smaller when diagnosed. So just be careful. If you see anything unusual, you should just go ask your doctor and they could tell you if it is or not, or take a skin biopsy. And finally, E stands for evolving. So basically, do you want to see if the mole, does it change over time? If it changes and looks different, um, or suddenly changes in size, shape, or color, it might be a sign of melanoma. So just go ask your doctor and get it checked out. Next, please. Okay, um, next we'll talk about some treatments for skin cancer. Next, please. Okay, so these are some of the treatments for skin cancer. Cryotherapy, which involves using liquid nitrogen. Um, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, that's a liquid nitrogen tube. So when you apply that to the skin, it will freeze those cancerous cells and um, that skin will die and come off. So it will help the tumor cells go off. 
Um, another treatment is electrodesiccation and curatage. And another one is Mohs surgery. So Mohs surgery involves um, taking multiple layers of skin and analyzing it under a microscope so that the doctor or surgeon could see exactly where the, the tumor cells are and see exactly how much skin they need to cut out. Um, it's a very precise technique so that um, those surgeons don't have to remove skin that is healthy. Oh, okay. Um, it looks like Anna's back. So Anna, if you want to take over, please do. Sure, I apologize for that. Had a couple uh, phone calls from some from some patients. So, um, and my and my dog is is kind of barking in the background. So I apologize for that. That's the the beauty of uh, these virtual presentations is we can do them from home, but also we have all those uh, extra 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 distractions. But anyway, so Kimberly, thanks so much for um, covering for me there. Um, so so she talked spoke about Mohs surgery, which is um, you really that's the gold standard for um, skin cancers that are found in part in specific locations, you know, on areas where you're trying to spare um, normal skin on the face, on the extreme, on the um, lower legs is another area, on the hands. Um, and she, I think she did a great job explaining most surgery. Another option for areas that aren't as cosmetically sensitive um, or, or where we have a bit more skin to work with is wide local excision. So that's where we take a certain amount of skin around the tumor um, and then we, um, cut, we cut it out and there are stitches. Um, another option for certain skin cancers and pre-skin cancers are um, topical chemotherapy or immunotherapy creams. One of those is called Effudex. There's another one called Amiquimod or Aldera. And those are um, chemicals that are actually, um, for, for example, for Effudex is 5-fluorouracil. So that's actually used as an IV medication for, to treat some cancers but it's also used topically to treat, um, to treat pre-skin cancers. And so it only interacts with um, uh, cells that have, have DNA damage. So it, it, only if, it will not affect um, normal skin, but a skin that has had um, some, some of those changes towards becoming can cancerous, um, it interacts with those and kills those um, while leaving the rest of the normal skin intact. And it's a great way to um, treat even even pre-skin cancers that we're not e we don't even see or feel clinically yet. And then another option is radiation therapy. And so my fiance is actually a resident physician in the radiation oncology department at Stony Brook. And I've gotten to see how they um, treat skin cancers with radiation um, there. So that's another good option for patients who uh, might not be a surgical candidate um, or who just you know don't want to go through a surgical procedure. Um, depending on the site and how big it is, um, those radiation therapies, it's usually, you know, maybe about a 15 minute visit and usually about 12 treatments um, is what is required to treat the, the skin cancer with radiation. Um, it's actually pretty interesting and neat, neat, neat to see. Um, and then for patients who may have had, um, it's uncommon for a basal cell or squamous cell to um, become uh, to metastasize or spread. Um, there are, but if, if in the event that happens and also for melanoma that becomes um, metastatic, meaning spreading to other organs in the body, there's targeted chemotherapies and immunotherapies. Um, and specifically for melanoma, there have been some really, um, you know, uh, life altering immunotherapies that have come out that have really helped um, patients to do much better um, if they're um, diagnosed with a, with a melanoma. And also we were just talking in our journal club today, we, we meet and discuss different scientific journal articles um, about once a month. And there are some really exciting um, new chemotherapies and immunotherapies for even for basal cell skin cancer and squamous cell skin cancer. Um, again, that's not the go-to treatment because hopefully you're coming to see your dermatologist or your, you know, your, your physician and are getting your skin, skin checked. Um, and so you're able to catch things before they were to spread. But if in the event they do, uh, there are some really good therapies out there. And go ahead and advance. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some research going on at Stony Brook. Um, so a few, we've had a few different studies. Um, the, the bottom three of these have all been completed, but there is one ongoing study that we are currently recruiting participants for. Um, it's called Patient Reported Outcomes Following Decision DX Melanoma Testing. And the principal investigator is uh, Dr. James Briley. 
Um, and so this is a really interesting, um, the, the world of melanoma is ever evolving um, and very interesting, but there is this new genetic testing that can be done that we can order for patients about, um, that, that looks at all these various genetic markers and then can also, can give a, um, basically like, uh, a stratified risk score, um, being that sometimes um, certain melanomas um, we would recommend a person to have a, an additional surgery where we would check a lymph node because if melanoma were to metastasize or to spread to other organs, it would first go to a lymph node. Um, and certain, depending on how deep a melanoma is, when we take the biopsy or take the skin sample, um, based on studies, we know that um, we should do and check a lymph node because how deep this melanoma is, we should probably check to see if there's um, if it has spread. But there are certain melanomas that are right on the cusp of being, you know, right just maybe a hair uh, short of being deep enough to be sent for lymph node dissection. And it's you know you're kind of like oh what should we do with this? And so this decision DX melanoma testing is an option for patients. And actually they co completely cover the cost of it, the decision DX melanoma testing, where you can have the have it sent um, and you could maybe save yourself from having to have a lymph node dissection um, where they do a surgery to, to check a lymph node. So just some interesting research going on that if you, um, I hope nobody is encountering melanoma, but if, if you were, this is a, a project that's ongoing. We can advance to the next one. Um, so this is Cancer Prevention in Action. It's the New York State Department of Health. Um, uh, cancer Prevention in Action is seeking to prevent and lower the risks of, of cancer in Nassau and Su Suffolk County. Uh, Stony Brook is promoting local policy systems and environmental changes which take action against cancer. Um, also, it's important to say that um, the United States uh, preventative, let's see, I cannot quite remember, it's the United States um, Preventative Task Force um, for Preventative Health does, they're the ones who kind of lay out the guidelines for how often a person should have a mammogram or a colonoscopy. At this time, they do not recommend um, skin screening for the general population, um, but they do recommend a sunscreen SPF 15 or higher. As um, we said earlier, the American Academy of Dermatology would recommend um, a sunscreen with an SPF uh, 30 or higher. And then our last little slide saying, spending a lot of time looking in the mirror may not be a sign of vanity, it may be a sign of intelligence, um, but we really should, you know, if you should be taking a good close look at your skin, um, you know, if you get out a, a hand mirror to help you look at the backs of your legs or I'm um, in those hard to see places, that's, that's a good thing. So, and I think that's, I think that's it. So thanks so much for listening. Um, does anybody have any questions at all for us? And again, I apologize for the for my being called away. Um, uh, you, you don't get too many calls when you're a dermatology resident um, in the evenings, but but sometimes they do happen. So appreciate your patience with us. Hi, this is Linda from Stony Rick. I do have two questions. Um, one for Haran. He mentioned something about you had a, a greater risk of skin cancer if you had a solid tumor, but he Went so fast, I didn't. I missed that part. Oh, um, sure. I could go back to that slide. Remember what where it was. Sorry about that for going a little too fast. Um, now you guys know what you're talking about. We don't. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, this. Okay. So yeah, for squamous cell carcinoma, uh, it states here that. Um, it's the most common skin cancer in patients with a history of solid organ transplants. So I'm not sure entirely the exact reason why. I don't know if anyone else can answer. Yeah, so the reason being is um, patients who are on, um, who have had a solid organ transplant, like a kidney transplant, lung transplant, et cetera, they're often on immune. Um, immunomodulatory drugs, so uh, medications to help prevent the immune system from attacking this new organ. Um, and so being that your immune system is somewhat downregulated, it it's allows, it does not, your immune system is not as good at recognizing um, can of possible cancers. So it makes you more um, prone to prone to cancer. 
of the of the skin. Um, and I'm not sure if there are others, but certainly with skin cancer. And so most time, most of the time, we're really good at working with our um, transplant colleagues because they will often recommend patients come in for regular um, skin checks. You know, at least once once to twice a year. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the other question was for Kim. She mentioned that from the AAD, you can get those um, like skin mole check diagrams. Do you know if they have, that, if they have them available in Spanish? Um, I'm not too sure about that. I can check the website now and get back to you um, if anyone okay. else has any questions. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Sure, sure, no problem. I think I just saw a question from the group chat um, saying, do you have any info, info for taking vitamin B3 to reduce chances of getting squamous cell or basal cell cancer? And that's true. We do recommend patients um, to take um, vitamin B3. It's also called niacinamide, um, 500 milligrams twice a day. Um, and that helps to reduce, um, reduce skin cancer. So that is something that we do recommend in our office, especially for our patients who um, have had, you know, numerous skin cancers. Also, even, you know, um, not wouldn't be a bad idea for I think any of us to be to be taking those those vitamins. Let's see. And somebody said a skin cancer screening can I can be done without the instrument you show on the slide. Um, so without the dermatoscope. Um, it can be done without a dermatoscope. Um, however, the dermatoscope is really helpful for us um, in dermatology because um, you know a skin, a skin, a mole may look you know suspicious when we're looking with the naked eye. But if we sometimes if we put that dermatoscope on the skin lesion, it can actually reassure us um, based upon how the the pigment it looks under the skin. There's different patterns that are uh, more reassuring than others. Um, so, so we do we do like to try to use our dermatoscope as much as possible, and I think it also probably helps um, prevent us from doing unnecessary skin biopsies. And it looks like Kimberly just um, put the body mole map um, on the a from the AAD website a link in the chat there, and it looks like there's only an English version, which is a problem because we want our Spanish speaking. Um, patients and community members to be able to have access to that. So I, we should speak to the AAD about that, definitely. Any other questions? Um, do you recommend dermabrasion for sun damage? Um, you know, to be honest, I don't know. I can't, I don't, can't speak a ton to um, dermabrasion um, at this point, um, you know, for, for sun damage, certain, certainly there are certain um, lasers that are sometimes used um, for different dark spots, um, but dermabrasion could maybe assist with, um, you know, some of the age, things we see from aging, which is, um, you know, the, as, the, as we age, the elastic fibers in our skin are um, damaged from, from, the, from the sun. And so sometimes doing things like dermabrasion or microneedling helps to promote collagen um, growth and can help kind of make the skin more firm. Um, somebody asked, what is the stance on spray tanning as an alternative to tanning beds? Um, patient might not be willing to give up being tan altogether. As far as we, as far as uh, we know, um, you know, spray tanning is there's there's no um, risk for skin cancer from spray tanning. So if that's something, or even some of those self tanning lotions to, you know, for patients that still want to have that, you know, summer glow and don't want to be uh, super pale, that those are those are good options. Any other questions at all? Going once, going twice. We'd be happy to, to chat about anything. Um, 
you know, we really appreciate um, your time. Oh, it looks like there's another message. How to pick the right sunblock. So um, maybe some of you have heard about the recall of the different sunscreens that um, was kind of in the news recently. Um, so some different um, products that um, we, we like in, in dermatology. We tend to recommend the cream sunscreens as opposed to the, um, the spray sunscreens. Um, there's both mineral blockers and chemical blockers. Mineral blockers have like zinc um, or titanium in the, in, the, um, in the sunscreen and it can really help to, um, it's, a really, it's like the, what, you, what you think of when you see the pictures of lifeguards with the big white nose. It's hard to, it's hard to rub in, but they, they work really well. And then they also do not, don't have to have um, the, some chemicals, which some patients are concerned about. Um, and then, um, otherwise, you know, things that say broad spectrum, um, we talk about, you know, wanting to have SPF 30 or greater. Um, and then, you know, from, from about 30% to 100%, you're only giving yourself, you know, a few percentage points more of sun protection. Um, but yeah, I would say Neutrogena products, um, um, Blue Lizard is another one that's very popular. Um, and then as far as the spray sunscreens that were recently recalled, it was because of some, um, of benzene that was found in the sunscreen, which was which is likely part of the um, was part of somehow it must be part of the air, the, pro, the producing side of the sunscreen, and so it's not um, not supposed to be in there. And so it's good that you know that there are groups that are looking at that and making sure that the sunscreens we're recommending patients to put on their skin is safe. So, any other questions at all? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time and attention. And um, um, maybe we'll see you at Stony Brook Dermatology one of these days. Thanks, thanks so, much. so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for coming.